So, Patty, um, thank you for joining me. For those of you who are watching this video, um, the person in the big screen is my best friend, Patty, who is a licensed and professional counselor in private practice in Eugene, Oregon. And um, she has agreed to talk with me today a little bit about suicide, especially as it brushes up against adolescence. So we're going to be talking about some of the things regarding this, kind of an informal way. Um, I just want to make sure that anybody watching this understands that this is not meant in any way to be a substitute for professional counseling or therapy, and that if you or someone you know has a concern about suicide, that's something that should be addressed with a professional yourself. So please don't use this as treatment of any kind. It's purely for discussion and information purposes. Is Thanks. that a good enough disclaimer, Patty? Absolutely, yes. I appreciate that clarity. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks. So um, the first question I have about it, about suicide in teenagers, is the idea of contagion. Like, it, it seems to me like a lot of times in the news, I'll hear a story about like one teenager in a school or a school district or a town commits suicide, and then it's almost like it, it's catching. So why, another, why does that happen? Person. Yeah, somebody else commits well, suicide. What happens there? Well, when someone that we know commits suicide, then it we have to kind of reorganize in our mind the meaning of that and how bad it is and or whatever. And it, it's kind of by understanding that person, it makes it seem more acceptable. So if we have some compassion or understanding or something for the person who killed themselves, and it's not... Um, I don't know if contagious is the word I would use, but it does seem to relax the, um, the barrier to it. And one thing we do know from research is that if someone has family members who have committed suicide, that does increase their risk. So I would imagine that it's a similar phenomenon. So not as much a genetic thing that makes family members more likely, but rather an environmental, like if there's suicide within your social group? Uh, it, it's super hard to separate environment and genetics in these kinds of things. <laughs> and I don't know that we can really. Okay. But yes, you know, I think that there's, you know, I, and I think we're making guesses and assumptions about why that does seem to happen, whether it's running in families. I don't think suicide actually runs in families. We just know that it kind of, you know, if you're looking at risk factors for completing suicide, knowing someone, being close to someone who has committed suicide increases people's risk. So are the people closest to the person who commits suicide, like let's say a teenager at a high school, are the people in that person's close social circle more at risk than people who just maybe, maybe saw them once in the hall? I don't know if there's any research on this. My guess would be yes. And, and I don't think it, only because they know that person, but we tend to hang out with people who are more like us. Oh. And so our close friends, if we are someone who is depressed or traumatized and suicidal, our closer friends are likely to be like that also. And so it, it looks like it's contagious maybe when it's really maybe independent. Okay. Um, my next question is, We've, we've talked before about the idea that thinking about suicide is, I don't know if normal is the right word to use, but not uncommon. Like people who are mentally healthy um, don't, like, I'm not saying plan suicide, but they think about, I wonder what would happen if I committed suicide or it, it crosses their mind. Right. When somebody, what's the difference between someone who kind of casually has a thought about suicide flit across their mind versus somebody who says, I'm going to commit suicide um, and then actually makes an attempt or completes a suicide. Like if somebody, there's this, um, I, I think there's this common belief that if I tell people I'm going to commit suicide, that I'm really not going to do it. And that the people who actually do end up completing suicide, there are no signs. So right. maybe so those I, are two separate questions, but I think they're really kind of the same. So the research that I have 
heard is that if you just kind of ask a community sample of people, which means just, you know, go around out on the street asking people, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Have you ever thought about suicide? About 60% of people will say yes. So that's pretty high. So, you know, and the person, at the presentation where I heard that statistic, the person giving that information said that he thought that was actually low. He thought that probably even more people than that think about it. And I think it's complicated because when I say to someone, have you ever thought about suicide or have you ever thought about death or dying? Um, what does it mean to think about suicide? So some people might say, yes, I think about it, but they not in a like, I want to die kind of way, but they kind of theoretically think about, hmm, why do people commit suicide and what does that feel like or what, you know, so I, I don't know that the question is super clear and I, I don't know um, what that research really looked like, but I do think it's fair to say that it's extremely common um, to have thoughts about suicide. And especially I think teenagers think about that um, because they're thinking about all kinds of things, right? And, and, it, and it's common if, they're think, if we're thinking about complicated and complex issues to internalize that a bit and think, what would that be like for me? What would make me think that? Or, you know, what what would I do if I decided to kill myself? How would I do it? Or whatever. And so, some it's pretty common to have thoughts like that. And that, you know, obviously, 50% of people don't commit suicide. So, you know, the correlation between thinking about it, even seriously thinking about it, and actually attempting is pretty small. So um, let's let's move into what, that second question then. What about people who say it to people? People who say it to people. So again, there's lots of different reasons for saying it. Um, I think there are some people who say it um, because they wonder what kind of reaction people will get or they, they have a need um, to get some help and they don't know how else to get it maybe. Um, you know, a lot, we use the phrase to get attention. People say things to get attention. And that's a pejorative phrase, but it's actually true that people need attention. <laughs> and so some people think that that's the way to get the attention that they probably need um, for whatever. Of, oh, sorry, I was just going to say that when you were saying that, it made me think about how sometimes in a, in a marriage, one spouse will say, I want a divorce, not because they actually want a divorce, but as a way to make the other partner realize how serious they are about the exactly. level of trouble of this issue. Exactly. So it's a way of emphasizing how important or serious or distressed someone is okay. um, to by saying that. So sometimes with that dynamic, then um, when you have educators who have training, most of us, most of us who are educators, as opposed to mental health professionals, right? We haven't. We've maybe taken introductory psychology classes. We've taken child development courses. Most of us have taken like human development. So the extent of our understanding about how all of this works really is, is limited to kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And that's kind of the extent of our, our level of understanding in, in general across my profession. And so with the dynamic that you're describing, it seems really tricky to tease out who really means it. So what do you think is fair to expect of educators or what is what how should educators respond if they hear or, and I know I, I, I'm asking you from your perspective as a mental health professional not as someone I'm not expecting you to have expertise in the laws that govern requirements for educators but um, just as a mental health professional what do you wish teachers would do for your clients if they heard a suicide mentioned comment read I don't know the right word so I think that the thing to recognize when we hear teenagers or anyone talking about suicide in any way is that they're talking about it for a reason and they probably need help. Whether or not they actually would or intend to commit suicide, they need help of some kind. And so taking it seriously and believing that the person is distressed in some way and needs some help is the best attitude to have. I don't think it's important to decide or know, is this person really at risk of committing suicide? I think what's important is they need help and then getting them to help. 
So I, I, and I know it's tricky. Um, so a story that I can tell is about a teenager I know of who was writing in the margins on her homework, things like, um, you know, what's the point? Life is kind of pointless, you know, things, I can't remember the exact phrases, but basically, you know, like, think, I don't know how to say it, because um, I don't remember exactly what she was writing, but. Um, Existentialist comments, yeah. Thank you, perfect, yeah, like kind of looking forward to her life and basically, you know, writing on the homework, why am I doing this? Life is pointless, what's this gonna get me in the, you know, whatever, right? And the, the teacher, I think it was actually an administrator who spoke to her, so probably the teacher, you know, passed it on that far. Um, so it's something like, you know, if you write these kinds of things, people are going to get the wrong idea. And that shut down the conversation. She didn't get the help she needed because she thought, oh, I'm not allowed to, you know, the message she got was, oh, I, I'm not allowed to express this need that I have. What would have and been a better way to handle that? A better way to handle that would have been to say, you know, it sounds like you're really struggling with some deep issues. Do you want somebody to talk to about that? Can I help you find someone who would, you know, be able to talk with you about this? Um, is that a time when it's appropriate to bring in parents? Um, potentially. So I, I think bringing in parents is tricky, actually. It's, it's the go-to for educators for understandable reasons, right? Like, the kids struggling or having any problem at school, and the first thing we do is, you know, call the parents. And most of the time, that's probably the right thing to do. Um, it's tricky because often parents, you know, from my perspective, I get kids in my office, and the parents are the problem. And so, off, you know, and I think that's a subset. You know, if we're looking at a school population, I think most of the time, probably, you know parents need to be told or accessing them and getting having them search out resources is a good idea. Um, but there are times, so if a, if a teacher or an administrator is, has any awareness at all that maybe there's some conflict at home or problems, then maybe just, you know, trying to find a resource directly instead of going to the parents or asking the kid, is it okay if I talk to your parents? What, what will your parents do? Yeah, I, I know. I yeah, I see. I see what I you're, see what saying. you're saying. And I see it. And I see it like from my own. From my own. I'm hearing an echo now. Hopefully, it goes away quickly. But um, from my own issues that I had when I was a teenager, that my parents were really at the root of. Um, my mother and my stepfather, actually. But yeah. under federal law, parents have access to kids' records, and so as soon as I say, as soon as I write. A note as soon as a counselor sees a kid, then the parent has a legal right to that. So it makes it a little bit trickier, but I like what you said. I'm going to well, pause. I'm going to, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you, you, I, I understand that because I have the same issue, right? Like I'm working with teenagers, their parents are the issue, but their parents have access to my notes. So <laughs> you have to be careful what you write down. <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, I'm going to pause our conversation here um, and then. Um, start back up again in just a second. Okay. 